I'm Paula Cohen, or some of you may know me as the Nut Job Mom from Instagram. My daughter Elizabeth has severe allergies to a bunch of things. Um, but I work with MedStar and SBH to spread awareness on all things food allergy. And a huge thank you to MedStar and SBH for hosting tonight and arranging this event. And thank you to Dr. Fisher. Um, so, um, Dr. Fisher is so much more than just an allergist and a really good one. He's my daughter's allergist. Um, he is the director of the Jaffe Food Allergy Institute. He is division chief of. I think I'm getting that. this right. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little nervous. Mount Sinai division chief. <laughs> division chief at Mount Sinai for pediatric um, allergy and immunology. And yeah, without further ado, thank you, <clears throat> Dr. Sisher. So I'm going to like stand in the middle because there's a camera that's <laughs> recording me for web use. Um, but I didn't make slides or anything. This is really just the idea of having an open conversation. I'll tell you some things that people like to ask me about so that like, you feel comfortable to say, oh, you said that, uh, go ahead and tell me more. Um, we were, I've already had some people asking me some questions about diagnostic issues, but you can think about, you know, there are, there are theoretical questions like why do we have more allergies these days? There could be questions about like what is happening in terms of treatment for food allergy. There could be questions about diagnostics, like how do you know if there's really a food allergy? They did these skin tests, they did these blood tests, what does it all mean? Um, do people outgrow the allergies? Which allergies do they outgrow or don't outgrow? What happens with an allergic reaction? Uh, how would I treat that if it's happening or how should I be treating it? Um, living day to day with a food allergy is a lot of work, so you can ask me questions about restaurants, about label reading, about the, you know, may contain and all those kinds of questions. Um, day to day things with school or, or travel or camps, um, <coughs> genetics, uh, environment, whatever you want. There's a lot of things that you can ask questions about. Um, I'm, I might act weird to repeat your questions, but I was asked to sort of repeat the questions so that um, it's recorded appropriately for people who watch later. So does anyone want to get the ball rolling? Oh, by the way, if you ask a specific question about your child, I may, uh, I probably won't say this is what you should do for your child because I'm not acting as your child's doctor tonight, even if I am your child's doctor, mm -hmm. um, because we really would have to sit down and discuss more specifics. But I might generalize the answer, so forgive me for that, uh, and kind of like rephrase it and say, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. So forgive me for that. But I have a hand up in the back. So congratulations to you for getting the ball rolling. So um, is there a theory or some kind of um, advice about how to not have your children develop the allergies in the first place? Mm -hmm. Should you be avoiding certain things or not avoiding okay. certain foods and nuts? Does that help? Does that so the, the question is about how do you do something so that your child doesn't have the allergy. And so the first thing I would say is, is don't be on a guilt trip that you caused an allergy. All right, so that's very important. It's not like, oh boy, what did I do or what did I not do that made my child have an allergy? That's not the way you should be going about this because even if I told you some things that we think would reduce the chance of having an allergy, it doesn't work for everybody anyway and it's really more of a statistical answer, meaning that for some people, you know, this may be the issue. So the, one of the exciting things about all of, all of the field is that there's a lot going on in research on treatment, on prevention, on understanding the allergies better. So one of the things that you know, started a thought process from a long time ago was about like when should you give a child from a family with allergies the allergenic foods. Let me start with the pregnancy question. Right now, during pregnancy, there, it, there isn't like anything saying that what you eat uh, results in some outcome of allergy. Like I didn't eat too much egg, I ate too much egg, I didn't eat enough egg or something like that. There are studies on, going on about whether eating more or less might have an impact and it might turn out that there's something there. But for the most part, in studies that have looked at maternal diets and outcomes for allergy, the specific allergens weren't the, the crux of the matter. It was more the type of diet. So if you have a healthy diet, so what's a healthy diet? Like a Mediterranean kind of diet, a diet that has fish in it, a <coughs> diet that has um, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables and that type of thing and isn't big on you know, greasy foods with unhealthy fats and margarines and things like that, the healthier diet kind of won out. So it wasn't whether you ate peanuts or not, it was more about just the full diet. When we get into lactation, breastfeeding, um, breastfeeding in general is protective of allergy, so that's a good thing. What you eat, 
Um, some of it might come through in the breast milk, some of the proteins come through, but it's variable from uh, person to person. And uh, although there are scenarios where what's passed in the breast milk might trigger an allergy in someone who already has the allergy, there isn't really any signal that what you eat creates the allergy. In terms of the infant eating the food, there used to be the idea that if you had a high-risk baby and you were going to use a formula, you should use what's called like a hypoallergenic formula, one that doesn't have whole protein in it, something like a, a broken down milk protein, for example, where it's not really regular milk. So after years of looking at various studies on that, the feeling now is that that does not protect for allergy. It doesn't make allergy, but it also doesn't protect from allergy. So I've kind of run us through pregnancy, through lactation, through bottle feeding, what type of bottle food it might be. So now we're up to the actual ingestion of the food and the, the uh, World Health Organization and others recommend exclusively breastfeeding to about six months of age. But the reality is, is that almost no one does that. And most people in the US are introducing solid foods around four to six months of age. And it doesn't seem to matter exactly when a solid food is introduced in terms of outcome on food allergy as a general comment, but the old recommendations were that if you had an allergic disposition, so notice this was one question and I'm giving like a one hour lecture answer, but <laughs> um, if, if you have a family where there's a history of allergy, the idea used to be, so this is old news, to hold off on milk to age one, egg to age two, and peanuts, tree nuts, and fish to age three. That old news came from one study that was done um, where they did exactly that. They had one group do exactly what I just said, another group just eat whatever they wanted whenever they wanted, and the babies from the group where they were getting milk and egg and things like that earlier were having more problems than the ones who waited longer. That was in the first two years, but technically in that study, when they looked at the kids at age seven, th they were even, like the same amount of allergies in both groups. So it didn't seem to be like a permanent difference. It was noticed, and I'm sure you've heard, this, I'm sure many of you have heard this story, that the rate of peanut allergy among Jews in Israel was lower than the rate of peanut allergy among Jews in, in the UK. <laughs> and, and that, you know, the, when they looked at what's the difference, the difference was the bomba, that on average babies, children were getting peanut snacks around nine months of age in Israel, whereas in the UK they usually weren't getting anything with peanut until after age one. And with equivalent genetic background with equivalent risk scenarios, um, it started to raise the question, maybe eating it earlier was actually better than waiting forever and forever, even though that initial study said there was a difference. So a study was devised where babies who were at high risk for peanut allergy were going to be randomized to eat peanut early or not. Now one of the nuances in that study was that they looked at kids between 4 to 11 months of age. And the way that they decided who was high risk for developing a peanut allergy was kids who had eczema. Okay, so if you're here because your child has allergies, there's a good chance that your child also had eczema, and I'll get to that as a separate thing. So what they did was they said kids who have bad eczema are at risk for allergies, including peanut allergies. And if you have someone who has an egg allergy, that's high risk too. So they, that's the group that they focused on. And they did an allergy test using a skin test of peanut. Before they, gave, before they decided whether they were going to give the children peanut or not, and if it was a large skin test, they just said, forget it. You're already allergic. We're not giving it to you. But if the skin test was negative or small, they randomized, like a coin toss, whether the baby would get peanut or not. I shouldn't say baby. It was basically age 4 to 11 months. And it turned out that after five years of either not eating peanut or eating peanut three times a week, the children who were eating peanut three times a week had less peanut allergy than the ones who were avoiding it all along. So it kind of pr proved that having the peanut in the diet from being a baby was a better choice. The studies looking at that for egg and for milk haven't been so clear. But for peanut, that was a pretty clear study. So the recommendations actually uh, came out about two years ago now, saying that if you have a baby who is like in that study, has really bad eczema, meaning that they needed medicated creams for their eczema, or has an egg allergy already, or you could probably throw in milk allergies or other food allergies, then they would see the allergist, get tested, and then decide whether it was safe for them to have peanut, and they might have to have peanut for the first time in front of the doctor. The babies could choke on peanut butter and can obviously choke on peanuts, so it has to be 
an infant safe form of peanut and bomba is one version of that but you could also take peanut butter and smooth it out you could put it you know on another food or mix it in in like an oatmeal uh, or you could buy very expensive peanut products that people are making to sell to people for this reason and then you're paying way more than peanuts for peanuts <laughs> but those products are, are out there for convenience so so that's that's how the thoughts have changed about um, the timing of introduction. But the other part of this story is about the eczema. And so when you get a food in your mouth, so this is not talking about someone who's allergic, but in normal scenarios, when you eat a food, your body sees the food, it's your immune system, the part of the body that fights infections and protects against cancer and you know things like that, that part of the immune system sees the food that you eat, normal people, I mean, I should say people without allergies, sees the food that you eat and makes responses to it, but it doesn't hurt anything. It just kind of accepts it, but it's there. Um, when you have eczema and you get the food on your skin, it's like you know, you're getting a protein in a place where it wouldn't normally be. And with eczema, the skin is very permeable and it's inflamed. So there's a lot of sort of bad inflammation happening and it's totally open to, to the environment. So years ago, we would see a lot of people would come in, my baby has eczema, what foods can I take out of my diet? What foods can I take out of the baby's diet to make it better? And the first thing I would say is, well, have you used any medicine? <laughs> and the answer was often, well, you know, we used that cream, it was okay, but it, you know, we stopped using it and it came back. So there was always this you know, uh, struggle with is it worth taking the foods out of the diet or is it better to just use medications and make the skin better because if you have the skin in better shape maybe it wouldn't be exposed to the things like cats dogs pollens and foods in the environment and in the meantime eating the food sees the immune system sees it in a way that is helpful instead of hurtful so even today when people come with children who have eczema, I will talk to them more about whether it really is a better deal to be taking foods away from someone who's already eating them or leave that in the diet and use medications instead. Yes? So I read a study that they said that they would be creating an EpiPen that's a nasal sort of EpiPen. How soon will that be coming in? Um, it, hasn't, it hasn't been studied in full clinical trials yet, so I don't know what the timeline is going to be. Oh, I'm sorry. It was a question about nasal. Uh, so, so basically, right now, the epinephrine is the medication that we give for anaphylaxis. Um, it works quickly to open up your lungs and make your heart beat strong and support blood pressure and make you feel better in the event of a significant allergic reaction. But it's given by a shot, so people are worried about the shot. So people would love to have something that's not an injection. And uh, the question was about a nasal spray version. So there, there's been, actually, for many years now, people have been looking at tablets under the tongue that have epinephrine and nose sprays that have, have epinephrine and things that are like multiple pokers kind of stuff but it's not a needle kind of thing. So there's a whole bunch of different administration routes for epinephrine that people have been looking at. And the question was when is the nose spray version going to come out? But uh, the answer is I don't know exactly because it depends on the FDA and on studies and things like that. So I can't even hazard a guess. I would imagine it's not going to be like in the next year or two. So, yeah, so a lot of people are worried about being near a food that they're allergic to, but most foods aren't going to aerosolize to an extent that is relevant in most scenarios people go through in the day. So, this, I would, I would actually potentially count, although I don't know the details of this, but I could count that as an asthma death rather than a food allergy death because people have, actually, many more people die each year from asthma by far than from food allergy. And in this case, I would count this as they were frying fish, the child already had bad asthma and inhaled the steam from the fish. I mean, that's a pretty strong exposure. Usually foods are not getting aerosolized like that. So for example, with peanut butter, which most people are, are worried about, you could smell peanut, but the protein isn't there. So we did a study where we took uh, 30 children who had levels that was high as it goes for peanut, um, a third of them, the families had said, we walked into a room and there was a problem. So we had them sniff peanut butter or sniff fake peanut butter that smelled the same. And, and 
when they were sniffing it, we didn't know which, whether it was the real peanut or fake. And the person didn't know if they were sniffing real or fake. So it was randomized. So they would sniff it for 10 minutes. And at the end of the day, one child had trouble breathing with it, but that was with the fake peanut butter. So it was just a panic attack, basically. And everyone, including that child, had actually uh, ended up sniffing the, pe or, you know, the peanut uh, butter that was real. And if we use uh, detectors to try to measure peanut protein over peanut butter, you can't find it. So it doesn't, it's oily, and it doesn't really shoot out protein. When you fry eggs, you can get the steam will carry some of the egg protein. When you boil milk, you can get some of that steam into the air. When you fry fish, as that example was, um, if you had powdered peanut, like flour, and you poofed it in the air, these would all be pretty similar to if you're allergic to a cat and you took the cat and you went, Aah! you know, you, your eyes would swell up. And if you had asthma, you could wheeze. Um, similar getting the food. There's a thing called baker's asthma where bakers can get allergic to the flour or to the p egg powder and things like that where they get wheezing, you know, from that food. But, you know, unless you have really bad asthma, you usually wouldn't have, you know, what happened to that person. Yes. What about if a kid has allergies already, like two teenagers allergic to nuts and sesame? So then is it better to avoid? Like, because I always heard increases the sensitivity that we talked about. Yeah, so, so, the, um, so you have a few questions buried in there, and I'll repeat. The question was, you have two kids who already have a food allergy, a peanut, a tree nut allergy. You know, do you try to eat the food or not? That's a different scenario because we're talking about prevention when someone doesn't have the allergy and going ahead and eating it. Um, like but avoiding um, processed with or, you know, the uh, That's another question. So we have now four questions <laughs> there. Um, so, so let me start out with, if you have the allergy, the recommendation is to avoid the food. You don't eat the food if you're allergic to it. There are treatments, which I get to, I'll talk about separately, um, of trying to eat the food that you're allergic to in very specific ways, but I'm going to put that aside for a moment. Um, people do outgrow allergies, even tree nut allergies. It can happen. And sometimes people are avoiding multiple tree nuts when they're not allergic to all tree nuts. So about 10% of kids outgrow a tree nut allergy. So if it's been like their whole life and they haven't gotten reevaluated, they should. There are many different tree nuts and they're not all the same. So we're talking about cashew, walnut, pecan, pistachio, pine, macadamia, you know, and the list goes on. You don't, you're not necessarily allergic to every one of them just because you're allergic to one. There are some similarities like cashew and pistachio don't look alike, but they act alike. And walnut and pecan act alike. But there are people who could eat, uh, isn't it kosher? Yeah. Okay. There are people who eat Nutella. That's hazelnut, or they can have, um, you know, almond butter, almond milks. But maybe they're very allergic to cashew, but they could eat those other ones. And then you threw in may contain. So you know, one of the issues with selecting some tree nuts and not others is really about the question of cross contact or finding products that are safe for that nut. So if you have like a walnut al allergy or a cashew allergy, there aren't as many products that have isolated. Um, or I should say, if you could eat those, there aren't as many products that are isolated for one or the other. It's easier to get products that have isolated hazelnut, like Nutella, or isolated almond, like cereals and, and almond butters and almond milks. You have to go a little bit more out of your way if you're dealing with other ones that are isolated. And if you're, if you're very allergic to one and you're buying a product and it says, you know, in a facility with tree nuts or may contain tree nuts, you don't know which one they're talking about unless they named specifically what it was. So you'd be avoiding those products, even if you did decide to eat some nuts and not others. As an aside, your question about may contain is a question about advisory labeling. So the labeling laws in the United States say that the major food allergens, namely milk, egg, wheat, soy, peanut, tree, nut, fish, and shellfish, not sesame, not other seeds, but milk, egg, wheat, soy, peanut, tree, nut, fish, and shellfish, they have to be on the label as plain English words, and they have to specifically name the categorical ones. So for example, tree nut, they'd have to say walnut. That's if it's an intended specific ingredient. What you asked about was what's called advisory or precautionary labeling, where there's many different words that could be used, like may contain in a facility with, on process, on equipment with, and all these different words. Those are voluntary, and we, we studied that a number of times um, for milk and egg and peanut. We certainly found contamination with products that had that. So it's not like, oh, I ate this a few times and it was OK, so I must be OK with this. There could be different amounts of contamination in different products. It could be different lot to lot. 
for peanut, we found 7% of the products that we tested that had any of those words um, had detectable peanut protein. And about half of those, or about 3%, had enough protein to trigger a reaction in sensitive people. The words, like if you're good at reading English, you might say, ooh, that one sounds worse than that one. I'll, I'll, I'll get this one. Um, but it didn't work that way. So a lot of people would say may contain sounds worse than in a facility that also processes, but it, that doesn't matter. Twenty percent of young kids outgrow peanut allergy. So again, most people don't, but it should be at least followed and checked. Yes. Hi. Um, my son has severe allergies. Among, um, fish is amongst them. Um, he hasn't always been airborne. I came to believe that he started to become airborne because I cooked it in my house. He, he's six now. I've been cooking fish for about five years of his life, and it was fine. Um, he got allergic to it once when I kissed him. That was the first time we realized he, he became anaphylactic. We ran to the hospital. He had a whole uh, reaction with EpiPens and everything. Um, the next time, he, he never had another, but thank God, anaphylactic reaction to it, but he was wheezing. and So the process went like this. I stopped cooking fish in my house because he was wheezing. Then I bought it baked, warmed it up. He was wheezing. And then I said, no more, I'm not baking it in my house. I brought sushi into my house, <laughs> ate it, and then he called me into his room. I went to talk to him for a minute, and then he said he was wheezing. At this point, I don't eat fish anymore. I'm, I'm like, I, I'm nauseous from fish. I'm scared. We're horrified from fish. But do I need, is this clear enough for him to be airborne? Like, he goes to camp. They're going to have tuna on the trips. I'm, as a mother, like, please don't serve them tuna. Just give them all cream cheese. Give them all something else. You know, I know there it's kids with dairy allergies. So, yes, yeah. I know. I know. So she <laughs> was telling me there's kids with dairy. I said, and my kid's allergic to fish. So what are you going to do? Both mothers care. Yeah. So you want the fish. She wants the fish. I want the you know. So He's allergic to dairy, too. Yeah. So, there's, so, there's no fish too. so I, I'm going to probably. So my question yeah. is, should I continue to, to try, or am I ma it seems like I'm making his allergy worse. Okay, so let, let me uh, sort of repeat your question and then go back to uh, the half of the question that was still left over that relates to yours. Um, so the question is, again, about airborne allergy reactions. And also wrapped up in there was maybe the question of do reactions get worse with each exposure. So the answer to the part of reactions getting worse to e for each exposure it, it's not an automatic thing that that happens. So it's not more comforting to say what I'm about to say, which is that it's more unpredictable. But it's not the case that every time you ingest the food or every time you're exposed to the food, it's worse than the time before. It doesn't really work that way. In terms of the airborne stuff, the food has to get airborne. Um, everyone has an airborne allergy if they have an allergy, if you want to look at, that, at it that way. Like if, if I aerosolize your food and spray it in your face as a powder, um, you're going to have symptoms from that, just like people with a dog allergy have symptoms or a cat allergy have symptoms or pollen allergies. You know, you go out in the pollen season, you get red eyes, you sneeze, and if you have asthma, you might wheeze. And the, the higher the concentration of it, the more symptoms you might get, which goes back to the question you had about, you know, the unfortunate thing. It sounded, to, it sounded, I mean, again, I wasn't there and I don't have the medical records or anything, but it seemed like it was like really intense. So, you know, those are all of the variables. So if you... For, the, for most people, if you have the food you know, on your lips and you kiss on the cheek, you might get red there. Um, we did the same thing, as I mentioned before, with peanut, um, with the smelling it. We did touching, too. So these were the same kids who had high levels. We rubbed peanut on their skin, on intact skin. A third of them got red where it was rubbed, and two-thirds didn't even have anything happen. When you do a skin test to a food, right, you, make, you take an extract and you scratch it into the skin, and then you get the bump. It's a localized allergic reaction, and we use that to help with diagnostics. But it demonstrates the, sort of the same idea that you, you need to get more of an exposure to get that to happen. Some people are going to be more sensitive than others, and some people who get you know, kissed aren't going to have a spot, and some kids who get, people who get kissed are going to have a spot. Kissing mouth to mouth is another story because then you're ingesting it. So, so that's a different story. So cold fish sitting on a table, even though you smell it, there's not protein that's flying off of it, but frying fish there is. As I mentioned before, boiling milk. If, you, if you're bean allergic and you're boiling soup with beans, and, or thick beans, then that's going to come out too. So, so 
but but then when you're done cooking, you know, it's not there in, anymore. On the other hand, if you are boiling something and the other person's food is right there, it's the same as if you have a gr like if well, if you <laughs> I'm I'm Jewish, so I have to <laughs> not kosher, but um, you know, if you have a grill with cheese and you put something else there that was meat, even if it is you know, technically uh, not mixed, maybe there's still going to maybe be some residue. So you have, those are different scenarios that could come up with cross contact. And similarly, if you were boiling something that has milk in it and it's right next to food and the person's very milk allergic, there is going to be some settling on that or splashing on it. So those are things to think about. Um, you know, even if, if there were like a chicken soup and a cream soup, even if they weren't being mixed, but if someone just forgot and put, you know, the the ladle from the cream into the chicken, then there's going to be some milk in there. So my question is, should I, should I continue to try like, to bring the sushi? I think you've answered your own question. You've had several bad uh, episodes. What's, you're, not, you're not making things better. It's not like making him healthier, um, and it's giving you stress. So I'm not, I don't, you know, if that were the scenario, I probably would just say, well, why bother? Yeah. So in those scenarios, he, you know, he shouldn't, he shouldn't be part of a, he shouldn't be part of a cooking project with it. Um, I wouldn't, I mean, I don't think the kids should be, you know, kissing each other mouth to mouth. Um, but and they're, they're going to play and they're young and I don't trust. Them. How old, how old? They're six. I okay. Mean, I don't so I would, I would just. To scrub them all when they yeah. I'm going to generalize this one, but what I would usually tell people in most scenarios, so like 99% of the time, um, it's unlikely that there's going to be a, an issue if people know about what's going on. So if they're going to be eating fish and your child is not eating fish, the kids might that day wipe their hands off if they're not wiping their hands off otherwise. And unless they're really getting, like, you know, at age six, it's a little bit less. Like if they were three-year-olds, I would be much more worried because people are sucking the same yeah. toys and stuff like that. But at age six, usually people aren't, like, grabbing things and sucking each other's food and stuff. But it also depends on your child's personality, right? So if you have a child who's, you know, developmentally not, totally there and they're going to grab someone else's stuff, then that's very different than a child who knows about their allergy and isn't going to, you know, share a water bottle with another child. Uh, actually, let me make sure other people get a chance to ask, so yeah. Okay, so I have a question. Um, my son's highly allergic to dairy with a lot of other things, too. Right. That, so we were on vacation and he took my other son's bottle and he, like, tried drinking it. A little drip went in his eye. So. Um, he had a horrible reaction, and then two days later, like even that day, so the next day he was developing, he was wheezing and all that. I came back home, and I went to the doctor, and I'm like, oh, he got another cold. He's like, and then I described what happened. I'm like, oh, and by the way, on the vacation, he spilled a little bit of milk on himself, and he had a terrible reaction. So I told him, he, number one, he said because the, the milk went through his eye, which is his membrane or something, so it was a direct contact. Um, and he had a whole whatever, he was like wheezing for a few days and whatever, we took care of it. Now, he's aller highly allergic to, okay, so he's allergic to wheat also. Let me, let me stop, stop you with the first story. So he tried to drink some milk and he also spilled in his, his eye. So getting uh, a food that you're allergic to straighten your eye, usually the eye sp swells shut. Um, yeah. Because, you know, that's, it goes back to the skin test, if you put a drop of, milk on the skin, it may or may not get red there, but if you scratch it in with an allergy skin test, then it does make the bump if you are sensitive to it. The eye is basically like an open sore. Um, and again, going back to the pollen story, when you go out in the pollen season, people's eyes get very itchy and you can't even see the pollen in the air, right? It's not like a thick drop of milk that went into the eye. So it's not at all surprising that there would be, you know, the eye thing happen. The part of your story that doesn't make sense to me is to have wheezing for days afterwards because of two things. Number one, if it was taken by mouth, it's possible to have, you know, more of a total body reaction, gets, it gets uh, you know, absorbed more that way. He has asthma. But, he, it, but to have asthma that goes on from a food exposure for days afterwards, it sounds like something else happened like more likely than, well, asthma like could be triggered cold. by a lot of different things. So I and the doctor's like, no, you're not putting the picture together. It's an anaphylactic reaction to... Well, then your doctor should have been putting him in the ER and giving him epinephrine, well, so... Well, he's, he's on... Uh, he's too young for epinephrine. That's not true. So, uh, 
let, let me generalize it. If there was another family like yours that told me this story, I'd be saying what I just said. So I, I don't want to disagree with your doctor, but I am disagreeing with your doctor. <laughs> that it doesn't make any sense that way. It's, it doesn't matter because if you said to me, my child you know, tried to drink the milk bottle, I swelled up and started wheezing, I'd say, cold, I, would, I would say that you should use epinephrine. That right then and there, oh, no, okay? It doesn't matter. I, you could have epinephrine as a, as a five month old or a four month old if you had to have it, yes. So, um, so we should talk about that instead of about, you know, who could best me on the worst allergic reaction. The more important question. Okay. The more important question is that he, was aller he is allergic to wheat and, um, and I've been giving it to him because I felt like he's allergic to so many things that he can't eat anything. So I slowly gave it to him and nothing was happening. Um, but then I noticed he was up every single night screaming in pain. I'm not sure if it's from that, but it was like a month of screaming in pain. So I forced the doctor to take a blood test, even though he said he's too young for it. And his numbers were higher in wheat than dairy, but he doesn't react that way to wheat. So okay. I know what to <coughs> so I'm going to have to, I'm, I think I'm going to be cutting people shorter because there's a lot of different questions rolled into this, and, and we can't really have, uh, you know, like an office visit right now. <laughs> but um, so, so there's a whole bunch of things that you've said that are not correct. Oh. And I don't know if your doctor's an allergist that you're talking about or, okay. So first of all, the number on the test doesn't mean that you're more allergic to one thing than another. And, and a number of 30 to wheat um, is not bad compared to a number of 10 to milk, okay? So the numbers mean completely different things for different foods. The other thing is, is that if you're giving symptoms like if someone's crying or d uncomfortable from a food, uh, I have to, you know, significantly ask whether that's an allergy or whether it's just, yeah. you know, you're, you're having a bad day or any other thing that, that's no, going on. So taking a food away from someone who's already eating it carries nutritional issues, it carries social issues, and it could carry issues of becoming actually allergic to the food even though you were able to eat it before. So those types of decisions about removing a food from the diet that's already in the diet so if it's, already in the, if it's already in your diet, if you have a food that's already in your diet and you're worried that it's causing a problem, you really have to talk to your doctor about that carefully. And not just about getting a test done, but really about what are the symptoms, does it match? Because if your child's able to ingest it, something's not too bad. I mean, they're not eating it and ending up in the ER. They're eating it and they're still you know, there in the crib or watching TV or whatever it is. So there's something going on where they could eat that food. And if you're worried that it's causing either a behavioral issue or a stomach ache or a rash or whatever it might be, if it's in the diet, you're, you're already there where, where the person is having it. Now you could tell me stories where, you know, rashes are terrible, child's not growing, vomiting, blah, 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 and yeah, I'm gonna wanna know more and see if that food is, is the trigger. But if your starting point is having the food ingested in meal size amounts, I would be hesitant to remove it from the diet unless it's really proven that it's a problem. And that proof doesn't come from just doing one single blood test or one single skin test. When we are worried about a chronic problem coming from a food, so for example, chronic vomiting or chronic other stomach problem or a chronic rash, the right way to look at that is to make sure that you're not having some other reason for those symptoms that could be addressed. So the doctor should be taking the full history and not just, you know, often, uh, you know, we want to see cause and effect with things, right? That's the human nature thing. It's like there's a cause and there's an effect. But it's very tricky with foods because we eat a lot of different foods every day. And then any symptoms, once you start thinking, is it the food, is it the food, you could connect it to almost anything because we have multiple, you know, things that we eat all day long. So anytime there's a chronic symptom, you could start to say, oh, I bet it's this or I bet it's that. And you could be playing with fire, taking things away from the diet. So the right way to do it is to really discuss all of the symptoms so that everything is considered. If there is gonna be a trial of going off the food, it has to really be done, I think, under doctor's supervision where um, you, know, the, you're, you have an endpoint where it's like, well, we're gonna do this for you know, a week, and if the symptom isn't like all gone, then you go back on the food. And if you think the symptom is gone, then we're gonna still you know, give it some time and try the food again and see if it really is related or not. Because many times you put the food back and you know, you're still fine. So the symptom is going to go away anyway. Yes? Um, aside from some top eight that my son is allergic to, mm -hmm. he's allergic to sesame, chickpeas, lentils, and green peas. Um, I've been seeing a doctor in your practice for a couple years now. He's my main doctor. I have like a local doctor as well. 
Um, so I asked him about natural flavorings because that scares me when I see it, even though it's like, I don't know, a strawberry fruit roll up. I'm still debating, does it have sesame, chickpea, lentil, green tea? Especially now with the new uh, health craze with the peas and the lentils. And so when I call, they don't want to disclose because it's propri proprietary. Mm -hmm. So I asked the doctor and he's like, look, it's um, not likely. Right. Okay, so not likely still doesn't like speak me <laughs> I'm getting a lot of compound questions. All right, no, so uh, let me... Just one second. Okay. I just want to tell you, so something recently happened with a bar that the woman ate by the airplane, and that had natural flavoring from what they said. I mean... Um, I'm not sure what story... Okay, so um, let me get back to... So that threw me off. A number of different things you brought up. So... Uh, so people with a peanut allergy, about 5% of, so peanut is a bean, even though it has the word nut in it, about 5% of people with a peanut allergy have problems with beans. When they do have problems with beans, they don't typically have problems with every single bean, but the beans that are more potent in that scenario, there's one called lupine that most people don't even know about, and then there's uh, chickpea, lentil, and green pea. And then there are a whole bunch of other ones that are less common to be a problem. Now your child might have a problem with these, but the ones that are less common have a problem with like black bean, white bean, kidney bean, lima bean. Right, so those are, and string bean almost no one has a problem with, especially the canned versions of these. So, so usually we allow you know, those to be eaten, even though you might have a problem with the others. And it's perfect, I don't know how old your child is, but as years go by, we definitely could relook at those beans because sometimes they do are able to get back into the diet. In terms of natural flavors, um, you're absolutely right that natural flavor can't be uh, you know, one of the major allergens, but it could potentially be almost anything else. So if, if, you, um, you know, if you're worried that that natural flavoring would be a bean, it's like the other doctor said, it's unlikely that that's what it is. It's more likely that it's going to be milk or something like that, actually. But um, they, ha they would have to label that. But um, sesame is, is the one that people worry about the most because that's more potent. So basically, if you have like a trace amount of bean, it's less likely to trigger a reaction. Not every, um, not every allergen causes a reaction at like an invisible amount. Mm -hmm. And also, not everybody with an allergy reacts at that invisible amount. So in other words, there are people who could eat you know, 10 peanuts, but if they eat 15, they start to have a reaction. It's not like everybody's like this. And with beans, usually it's not like a trace amount of bean. So that's one reason I think that the other doctor said what I would have said, which is that you're probably, if it's beans that you're worried about, it's probably not going to be a major point, point of that. There are a lot of products now that I think you were alluding to that have concentrated pea protein. And there's also something called soy protein isolate. And there are people who react to that even though they are okay So with others. So for example, there are kids who, who are okay with a plate of beans, but if they have the concentrated pea protein, they have a problem. Or they might be okay with tofu, but if they have the soy protein isolate or soy protein concentrate, they have a problem with that. So it's the, it's the amount that's involved. And I think that's part, that is, I've said this already, but I think that's part of the reason why they said not to worry so much about it for beans. For sesame, if you just have some, so for most people, this isn't like necessarily everybody, but for, for most people with sesame allergy, they can tolerate a few seeds or even 10 or 20 seeds. One drop of tahini, you all know what tahini is. One drop of tahini is like 60 or 80 seeds worth of protein. So it's a lot different. And so, you know, usually the first reaction is hummus or something like that. And for most of my patients, again, generalizing, I don't know about your specific story, but for most of my patients, I'll just say, don't worry about like, is there a, you know, I looked at the bagel, I didn't see a seed, do I, you know, do I get to eat it or not? And like, yeah, you can eat it, because even if it did have a seed touch it or, you know, so embedded if, if there's sesame, like traces of sesame seeds on a bagel, but it's a plain bagel that's being given in the school, I, I said, can my child be <laughs> Ask your doctor. Um, but I'm, what I'm saying is that, that most people um, aren't gonna react to the seed touch the bagel, or even if there are a few seeds on the bagel. So you'd have to talk to your doctor to see if that applies to your child, but that's for most people. Mm -hmm. Let me say one more thing about calling a company with natural flavors and things like that. So a lot of times it depends on how you ask the question, and the, the, there's sort of several levels to this. If you 
call and you say, you know, I, my child has an allergy and I want to ask a specific question about your product, my child is allergic to sesame and your product says natural flavor. Is that natural flavor sesame? Because if it is, then I know I can't have it. There, not every company, but more companies will be willing to immediately say, no, that's not in there, or yeah, you better not eat it. I'm going to give you a few. I, I, already, I already preempted my answer with saying that not every company, but many companies will be willing to answer the question if you phrase it that way. If it was really, really super important, you could sign a non-disclosure agreement to get you know, the, the ingredients, and, and a doctor can help you do that if it's really that important to eat that product. And I've done that in some cases, but I'm not advertising the, to call me to do that because it's, it's probably not worth it. But, but on the other hand, depending on how you ask the question, sometimes you will get the answer that your allergen is in there because at some point they don't want to be bothered and it's easier for them to say there's a problem. So I'll give you an example on that. A lot of people at one point were telling me that Tylenol had nuts in it. And I was like, what are you talking about? So you know, sure enough, you, you call companies like ibuprofen and Tylenol and you say, you know, does, this have, does your product have nuts in it? They're like, no. Well, are you sure? Because my child's allergic. I mean, can you ask somebody else? Are you sure? Are you sure? And then they, then they start saying things like, oh, we can't guarantee that there's no nuts in it because we don't do an assay to find out if there's nuts in it. So there could be nuts in it. So you know, when they said that to me, I said, you are a terrible person because <laughs> you know very well that this is a GMP, good manufacturing facility. It's a pharmaceutical. And it's not like people are having lunch over the vat of acetaminophen, right? It, I mean, it's clearly not going to have any food protein in it. It's a chemical that they're treating like gold. And, you know, it's just the way that you ask the question where they get to a point where they are answering it in sort of a legalistic way. So, so you have to, you know, decide how much time you want to spend on the phone. But, but asking the questions in the right way. Yes? So that's a, it's a great question, but um, the quick answer is don't do that. Um, there, there are a lot of therapies that are being looked at, and one of them is exactly what you just described. Um, however, in the studies that are looking at that, at giving people the food that they're allergic to, um, in most cases it doesn't make the allergy actually go away. The person becomes dependent on eating it very frequently to kind of keep up a threshold. So. Um, I assume at some point people are going to want to ask about therapies coming down, down the uh, pike. And the one that you're hearing probably the most about is oral immunotherapy. And there are people who are doing it in practices. Um, it's basically taking a very small amount of the food you're allergic to and giving it to you in gradually increasing amounts. So this is a, a treatment that in some countries has been going on for quite a while. And Israel is one of the places where in academic centers they're doing it. In this country, most academic centers are not doing it. There are some private practices that are doing it. Um, in Australia, the allergists got together and said, we're not doing it, period, because it's not proven to be safe enough. Um, in other countries like Japan, they have been doing it for, for, for a while. Um, the studies basically uh, show that most people who try to, and this again is not a thing that's done at home, um, most people who start with a small amount and try to gradually increase can get onto some amount that's higher than what they were able to eat before. Depending on the food, some people shoot for very large amounts, like with egg or milk or wheat. For other foods like peanuts or nuts, usually people are shooting for a modest amount that's just like more than you would maybe accidentally eat. The benefit, theoretically, is to have a higher threshold than you started with to make it less likely to have a reaction if you had accidentally eaten some of it, or in the case of things like milk and egg, to try to get full amounts into the diet. There are, there's a company that's you know, in what's called phase three or final trials of, of peanut oral immunotherapy, and we're waiting to see what the Food and Drug Administration is going to say about approving that. Um, they're supposed to, I think, make a decision in 2019, so this year, but it's kind of up in the air as to what they're going to say. I don't know what they're going to say, because in these studies, it's, ki it's kind of like good news, bad news. So, so in one of the studies that was just published, about two-thirds of the people, so the, the way it worked was the people had to react to less than a third of a peanut. 
they go on this gradually increasing amount. They take it in front of the doctor each time, and then for a couple of weeks, they take the amount that they were able to have at home, and they come back, try to eat more in front of the doctor, take that for two weeks and come back, et cetera. Basically building up to about one peanut's worth of peanut. And then after a period of time, they have a feeding test, so they try to eat it in front of the doctor to a higher amount. And the end game here was to eat about two or more peanuts. And so two-thirds of the people who started the study and were um, in the group that had the real stuff um, were able to eat a couple of peanuts worth of peanut before they started to have symptoms. So it raised their threshold from that less than a third to more than two, which is good. Um, the other group is a placebo group. So they were eating fake peanut the whole time. They didn't know what they were getting and all of that. The thing that's going to be interesting for the FDA to deal with is that the placebo group, when compared to the treatment group, had less allergic reactions and anaphylaxis basically through the treatment. And if your goal is to have, you know, not have allergic reactions and anaphylaxis, then you would have won by being in the placebo group. If your goal is to raise your threshold, then you would have won by being in the treatment group. So which one is really the winner kind of depends on how you look at it. And I'm not sure how the FDA is going to look at it. Another um, therapy that's in later phase trials is the patch, which is kind of like a nicotine patch for peanut. That one um, you basically wear on your skin. The problem with that one is that you don't know what it's doing for you because it's just a sticker on your skin. Whereas with the one that you're eating, you kind of know like, oh, I'm eating this and it's giving me a stomach ache or I'm vomiting versus I'm eating this and I'm not vomiting and you know you're eating something. So with that one, you kind of get instant feedback. With the other one, you just have a sticker. So when people looked at that one, it also raised the threshold, but not as much, as, so not as robust as the oral immunotherapy, but with very little side effects. And about half of the kids didn't get a benefit from it, but half did, and it had a variable benefit for the ones who did. And it also looks like the longer you wear it, meaning years, it may help more. So that's the other product. There's also studies with taking very small amounts and putting it under, under the tongue. Um, this one basically had similar outcome to the patch one, um, except you're just putting it on your tongue for like a minute and the patch you're wearing for 24 hours. So it depends again on how you look at it. Then there's a whole bunch of other therapies that aren't as far along. Injection therapies that use modified proteins, meaning that if I just injected you with peanut when you're peanut allergic, you can imagine that would be a bad thing. But if you change that protein in a way that makes it less allergenic, then that may be a way of getting an allergy shot. Like people who have insect sting allergy, like if you have bee sting allergy, going on allergy shots basically cures that allergy. So there's allergy shots for food that's also being looked at. And then there's a thing called biologic. So that's sort of like an umbrella term for different um, products. They're basically antibodies, so it's like a protein that affects different pathways of the immune system. One of them is uh, Zolair or Omalizumab. Zolair is the brand name, Omalizumab is the, is the product chemical name. Um, this is anti-IgE, and IgE is the protein that we measure when we do the skin test, when we do the blood test. So it basically sucks that up to some extent and intrinsically usually changes the threshold for whatever you're allergic to. Um, there were studies on this even 15 years ago, but they kind of petered out for reasons I won't go into, but they're ramping up again. And so that is um, you know, potentially a kind of treatment that would help multiple food allergies at once, but you'd have to stay on that treatment too. Um, and there are other uh, products that are being looked at that also dampen the immune response against food. So I think, you know, standing here today, um, probably the more imminent things that are available for your kids are going to end up being things like oral immunotherapy or the patch or, you know, things along those lines. But they do carry side effects. You know, when you're taking, you know, the oral immunotherapy kind of treatment, you could have a reaction sort of out of the blue. Um, if you get a virus, you get more reactive. If you can't exercise for a couple hours after taking it, and some people get a chronic gut problem um, where they're, the tube that goes from the mouth to the stomach, the, es the esophagus gets inflamed, and then they have problems with swallowing. So there's, there are good news and bad news with a lot of those, but I think that what we're looking at for you know, five and 10 years from now is going to be a lot different. Is there an age limit that they have to start by a certain age? So it's a very good question about age for treatment. And we're actually, so the, the studies that have been looking at oral immunotherapy for FDA approval start at age four. <clears throat> but now we're doing studies that are going younger than that. Oh, and um, I wouldn't say that. The, the study that looked at um, the 
oral immunotherapy included through the adult age range, but they didn't have enough people who were the older people to really make good comments on it. But interpreting your question in the other direction, is it easier to do oral immunotherapy or more effective to do it on younger kids or babies? The answer might be yes, mm -hmm. and we have to just study it more. It's actually much more of a harrowing experience to try to give you know, a, a one-year-old a, a food that they are allergic to because they can't say my mouth is itchy. So you're kind of like holding your breath a little bit, making hoping that they're not having more of a symptom or more progression of symptoms because they're not able to like say, oh, my, my tummy's hurting. You know? um, I'm still going to try to spread around for people who didn't get a chance to ask. So my daughter had a reaction at one to peanuts. And after that, now she's four. After that, every year we put her orally, uh, we tested her blood and skin test, and she never had a reaction since. Is it possible that the skin test and the blood work isn't absolute? I actually am not sure I followed this. So she is allergic or isn't allergic? She's aller she had a reaction at one. Right. Now she's four. She hasn't had any reaction since. And the tests are negative now? Tests are positive for allergies. Okay. So she just hasn't eaten it again. Just hasn't eaten it. No yeah. Exposure, nothing. So, so, the, um, so I haven't really talked about testing much except to, I think I alluded to, that the, the two kinds of tests that we look at are the skin test and the blood test. But the two other tests that people often don't think so much about are the most, very most important test, which is the history, the story, and the best test, which is the feeding test. So the reason the story is so important is because I want to know, you know what was eaten, when it was eaten, so when someone's telling me a fish story, I'm also thinking, if, is this a person with a cashew allergy? Did, was there you know, potential that they had you know, lemon seeds because they squeezed lemon over the fish, blah, blah, blah. So, so talking about what happened is very important to help make the diagnosis and, and, to, and to interpret the tests. <coughs> that's that's a, a starting point. So getting a test, so a lot of people will get a test done and you know, tests will be done to foods the child's already eating, and they'll all of a sudden like, oh, my child's allergic to it. I better stop giving it to them. Oh my gosh, that's a bad decision, right? Shouldn't have had the test done. And sometimes people you know, will not have tried a food yet, and there's a test done, and they don't really have a story behind it, so there's more to talk about there. When we follow um, an allergy over time, we also are looking, you know, is the test decreasing with time? Is the skin test getting smaller? Is the blood test getting lower? If I go into the park and just say, hey, everybody, line up. You know, we're going to do allergy testing today. About 10% of the general population test positive the peanut. But obviously, 10% are not allergic. So most of those positives would be irrelevant. And do the numbers but get worse? Um, they could go up, yeah. Um, but the, uh, the, the, I lost my train of thought, the correlation of allergy to the test result really depends going back to the history. So back to you, my child ate peanut butter, had an allergic reaction, we did a test and it was positive, that confirms you know, the story. Now if you said my child ate this mixed stuff, there were like 10 different ingredients, I'm not sure what did it, it's a different story. Mm -hmm. But it was just straight peanut butter, that's all there was, and the peanut test was positive, then that matches. Now over time, that test might go up, it might go down, it might stay the same. If it's going up, it usually means that allergy is hanging around. If it's staying the same, that might be good news because if it's staying same at a low value, the person actually might be outgrowing it even though the number's the same. If the numbers, if it's at a low value. If the number's going down, that's even better because maybe it is being outgrown. As I mentioned before, only about one in five outgrow it, but that would still be great if that's happening. The number doesn't tell you the severity. The number doesn't tell you the severity. And if I didn't mention it already, the number doesn't really tell you the severity. Why? <laughs> because if you have asthma, then it's more likely in an allergic reaction you have a more significant reaction because your lungs are twitchy. It matters how much you ate. So if you had just a little bit versus ate like five big bites or a whole sandwich, you're probably going to have a worse reaction with the larger amount. So the, the test doesn't know those things, so it doesn't really tell you that very well. What the test is good for, because your next question might be, well, what good is the test? The test is good for monitoring it, and the test is good um, because the numbers are like a statistic. So the allergy testing is not like a pregnancy test. Usually you're either pregnant or you're not pregnant. There's usually not an in-between. And with a cholesterol test, it's like a risk assessment, right? The higher my cholesterol, the more likely I might have a problem. 
So same with the allergy test. The bigger the skin test, the more likely there's a problem. The higher the number, the more likely there's a problem. But that's not the whole story. Nowadays, we also have some tests that are a little bit of like a next generation test, and there's even better tests coming along. You might have heard about component tests or molecular tests. It's looking at the different proteins in the food. That adds some information for certain foods. So if I'm allergic to you, am I allergic to your eyeballs, your liver, your kidney? Like what part of you am I allergic to? Well, a peanut isn't like one protein. It's a collection of many different proteins. And one of those proteins called ARAH2, just sort of like that's the name, could have called them John um, or Shlomo or whatever. Um, so that, that protein is, is responsible for a lot of the more significant allergy. Um, if your immune system sees that protein, well, that's the protein that gets into your bloodstream, so that's more of an issue. There's another protein called ARAH8 that breaks down from digestion, doesn't really get into your bloodstream, so if your immune system sees that, you probably could eat peanut without a problem if that's the only thing that it's being, that's being seen. So those are a little bit more sophisticated tests. They're available for some other nuts also, like walnut and Brazil nut and cashew and hazelnut, egg and milk. Um, looking at the different proteins. It gives us just a little bit of extra information. The skin tests are maybe better than the blood tests in the idea that they kind of sh show us, you know, at least what the biologic activity is on the skin. And if the skin tests are really humongous, what does humongous mean? Like something that's like that. It's pretty hard to imagine the person could eat the food without some symptoms. And so usually when it's a large skin test, there's going to be some problem. When the skin tests are smaller, then it becomes more of a likelihood that the person may actually be able to eat it. And that's where the most definitive test comes in. Do you remember the most definitive test is? Food challenge. The eating test or food challenge. Or the, the kind that we use in studies are called double blind placebo controlled food challenges. And all that means is that like I had explained for the smelling test that we did, the food is hidden in another food. And so one time when the person eats gradually increasing amounts in front of us to see if they're okay or not, it's fake. And another time it's real and we don't know which is which until after the whole thing. The reason that's done in these studies that are studying treatments is because people get nervous. And if you know you're eating the food, you might start getting a stomach ache even though you're really not gonna have a problem, you're just nervous. Or you might even have trouble breathing like I explained before for that person who was sniffing something that they thought was peanut but wasn't. They just got nervous and felt tight chested and things like that. So anyway, the feeding test is the, is the most definitive way. My job is to put together the story, the blood test result and the skin test result and then tell the family, what do I think the odds are that there's an allergy or not? I might say it's 50-50, I might say it's 80-20 or 20-80, and then it's up to us again to discuss, does it make sense to do a food challenge? If you have a three-year-old with a 70% chance that they're allergic to egg, maybe we'd say let's wait longer. If you had a 17-year-old who had a 5% chance that they're not allergic to egg, you might say, let's do that food challenge because this is a person who's going on you know, to their adulthood and if, they're, if they have a, you know, 5% chance, let's figure it out because that would be great. So, you know, you might interpret the odds differently in different age groups or for different foods. You know, if you had a 10% chance of a Brazil nut allergy, well, nobody wants to eat them anyway. <laughs> um, but if you had a 10% chance of an almond allergy, like let's do the feeding test because now I could have almond milks and almond butters and yeah. like useful food. Yeah. So in regards to the food challenge, we have a group chat, so like some mothers comment and this and that. So let's say one mother her son passed the food challenge. Uh, everything went smooth sailing. A few times later, when they ingested the food, they complained that they had reaction. Mm -hmm. So is that an actual fail, or is that like, should we do the OIT at home type of thing? Uh, you know no. I mean? like so those are two different things. Let's separate those. <laughs> Right, but I'll answer the question first being, the second part is no. Um, the first part is really the, what, you what you've experienced or what you're talking about. So when, when we do a food challenge, we try to achieve a full serving amount of the food. Sometimes people do food challenges and they end up where the child's picky about it, doesn't eat the whole thing, that's a different scenario. Or maybe the doctor like, just decided not to feed the whole thing. But if we, if we do a meal size amount, usually there's just not going to be a problem again. But when I finish that challenge, I say to my patient, 
you know, there still might be reactions. Don't, don't need any more today. There still could be reaction, even though we watched you for two or three or four hours with no symptoms, you know, t watch today. If everything's okay today, start eating it tomorrow. You could just dig in. There's about a two to three percent chance that there still will be a problem. So it's not 100 percent. Most things aren't 100 percent, but 97 percent of the food challenges, when they're passed, it's just okay forever. Hey, you could be an adult that develops a new food allergy too, but about two or three percent of the time, someone ends up still having a problem that week or so after they pass that initial feeding, and Talk to your doctor about that scenario um, because they, you know, it's worth like, well, gee, if it was just an itchy mouth that was transient versus like there was a whole big reaction. I mean, those would be very different discussions. Um, only raise your hand if you haven't been called on yet. Then, then I don't have to memorize who got to talk. Okay. Okay, so I have quite a few here. I'll stick to, I'll just go in. Go for okay, it. Okay, so the first question related to EpiPen use. So I've heard that. EpiPen use is not necessarily safe, and then with every additional EpiPen use, it can recreate um, worse symptoms in a child. Okay, hold on. I have to answer that, yeah, so don't uh, don't go on to the next one. Okay. So that's the second person who's told me like complete bubba mice is about <laughs> epinephrine. Um, so epinephrine is a medication that uh, is like a hormone kind of medicine that your body actually makes adrenaline. Um, the reason that you're giving it an allergic reaction is because the action that it has is sort of like everything that you want it to do to make an allergic reaction calm down. It, as a minor thing, stabilizes the allergy cells so they're not so reactive. But more importantly, it makes the, the lungs open up. It's like, an, it's like if you had a terrible asthma attack, getting epinephrine by a shot is better than taking you know, the inhaler. And actually, before they had the inhalers, when people had asthma attacks, it was, hey doc, my asthma, here's the shot. Oh, thanks doc, I'm better. Hey doc, it's been 20 minutes, my asthma's coming back, here's another shot. Thanks doc, I feel better, okay? So when they invented the asthma medicines decades ago, that ended, but that, that was what, what happened. So anyway, epinephrine uh, makes the heartbeat faster, but so does exercise. Epinephrine makes the blood vessels tighten up, so it makes the blood uh, circulate better. Having epinephrine early in an allergic reaction reduces the chance that you're going to need a second dose and reduces the chance you're going to be hospitalized. So I haven't really said anything that's bad. Some people get headaches. They might get flushed. They might get a headache. Uh, I said headache. Um, you know, they might feel like jittery or have feel like they're having palpitations, but it's not a dangerous medicine. And you don't get used to it. So it's not like, oh, if I use it now, it won't work next time. So that's not right. And if you needed a second dose because things were getting worse again, you just take another dose. Um, about 20% of the time people end up getting a second dose. But usually people are already in the emergency room, at least around here, if you're, we're not like in rural areas. So usually you're in the emergency room before you would probably need that second dose, but it's recommended to carry two. So babies can get epinephrine, but it has to be the right dose. Um, any age could get epinephrine. Epinephrine is probably most dangerous for like, you know, an 80 year old with heart disease because you wouldn't like put them on the track and say, let's run as fast as we can. And that makes their heartbeat fast. Okay. So, um, so that's that. I also, do you know how to use these devices? Uh, there, I have three different devices. Um, this is the EpiPen, which also comes as a generic, which is the exact same thing. So if you're into brands and you only will wear Calvin Klein, that's <laughs> fine. But, but if you can only get the generic EpiPen that looks exactly the same, it's made the same, it just has a different label on it and it costs less, I won't worry about it, get it. But anyway, that, this is it. The, um, the instructions on use have changed a little bit lately. Um, they used to have you count to 10, now it's three, and I always used to say count to 10, out of 10? <laughs> because it basically goes, Psh! the medicine is out in like a second. Anyway, so this is uh, a trainer of the device. You make a fist around it. The cap is blue, blue toward the sky. Don't put your fingers over any ends anyway, because you can't make a mistake if you just hold it in the middle. It gets pressed <laughs> against the thigh. Now they talk about swinging and firmly pressing. So if you wanted to do that, it would look like this. I don't really see a reason to do that, because if you're kind of like I am and you're not good at sports, you might like miss or something. So you might as well just press it where you need to, press it firmly, it'll click, and you're gonna count to three. One, two, three, and that's it. That's what I'm saying, it's not 10 anymore. 
You could still count to 10 if you want to, but you only have to count to three. Um, the reason they reduced the number is because it was silly anyway, because it's gone in a second. And then the kids would be like going like this, and you're trying to hold it in place for no reason, and they'd get cut. So let me show you again that this is reset, but you know the, this is the end where the medicine comes out. So unlock, one, two, three. And when I take it away, you'll see that that opened up. It would be covering the needle, so you never see a needle. Um, so it's basically going around here. Now, people will say other little nuances, like you could massage the area afterwards. It can go through clothing, but if you have time to lift the skirt up or bring pants down, that's fine to do, because you don't want to hit like a key in the pocket. This is the adrenoclick, which comes as a generic. This is a little confusing, because a generic epinephrine auto-injector might be this, or it might be the one I just showed you. This one has the same medicines, perfectly fine. If this is all you can get from the pharmacist, it's fine. It's just a little bit different. You need to know how to work it, but you make a fist around just like the other one, except it has two caps, one and two. That's it. Then everything else is the same. You press, it clicks, you count, you take it away, but the needle will still be sticking out. It doesn't have a thing that covers the needle. So sometimes school nurses aren't a big fan because there's a needle, but anyway, it still works and it's, it's fine. It's the same medicine. Then we have the talking one. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, all of these devices have been recalled, so if you want to be if you want to be nervous about it, they're, they all they've all been re recalled. So if you if you don't want one that's ever been you know not recalled, then you can't have anything. Um, so so this one talks, and th the instructions from this one also have changed a little bit. But this is the trainer for the newer one, and this is annoying because it talks too long. But this trainer contains no needle or drug and is for training purposes only. So obviously the real Do one doesn't say that. During an allergic emergency. So the real one starts with this. If you are ready to use, pull red safety guard down and off of this trainer. Please so I'm going to do that. Two, one. Training. Like so the real one would say injection complete. Like now, the other thing about this one, um, you don't have to, the, the voice activation, uh, the voice is just instruction. You don't have to listen to it. It's, it has, and, and the device itself is not battery powered. It's, it's still, you know, just a mechanical powered thing. So if you want to use it, you could do this. You're done. Okay. So if you know how to use it already, you just use it. If you don't know what to do or you need someone to guide you, then you can listen to it. Is there an effect if you don't, like, I, I'm always avoiding the epipen. I know that might be a very terrible thing. I'm standing up for action. Um, I go to very allergic to a lot of things, but uh, like, let, let's say dairy, she has a too. Like, if she had a uh, first thought with that, the, the Benadryl, I'll even give her steroid, and she gets better. Like, Oof. And never okay. So, and then um, then so it takes, food. so most people who have an allergic reaction don't die. Um, but you need to talk to your doctor about when to use epinephrine. The steroid that a lot of people uh, talk about, it takes about six hours to kick in, and it probably doesn't do anything for anaphylaxis anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's controversial as to whether you even get anything out of taking a steroid for an allergic reaction. And if you do, it takes hours to, to do anything. No, um, so the steroid is basically water for the aller allergic reaction. Um, I wouldn't be putting any dependence on it. And uh, the biggest thing I worry about is people using it and then not using the medicine they should be using and letting the reaction <coughs> progress. The second thing is about antihistamines. So antihistamines <coughs> are fine comfort care. They help uh, reduce itching. They help reduce sneezing. They help you know, with the hives. But they don't help with the circulation. They don't help with the breathing. And they also take about 30 minutes to kick in. So if you gave the antihistamine, you go like, oh, it works in two minutes for me, then it probably was you were going to be getting better anyway without it. Um, the, the dosing, uh, so I like Zyrtec actually uh, because it still takes the same 30 minutes to kick in as Benadryl does, but it doesn't make you as sleepy uh, and it lasts longer. So the Benadryl downside, it, it makes you sleepy and that can be confusing when someone's having an allergic reaction and they're sleepy. It's like, are they sleepy? Are they hypotensive? What's going on here? Um, but it's fine to use Benadryl, there's nothing wrong with it, it's just that there is some reason to prefer uh, Zyrtec. 
And then using liquids is often handy, although then people like don't want to carry bottles. You can get the screw top air, like they, they sell online, like airline, so there's like three ounce, you know, so it's a little bit more convenient to carry. Um, so you could do that. Um, if you want to have chewables or pills, that's fine, but then you, know, you have to depend on your child to be able to chew it. Uh, and swallowing a pill, you usually don't have water around, so that's a different thing. And then if it's a capsule, you have a capsule in your stomach, it's not really releasing. So it's, it's probably best to use the liquid or to use a melt away or chewable if, you don't, if you're not able to carry a liquid with you. Um, but ultimately, when do you use the epinephrine? And the answer would be that if the symptoms are more than mild symptoms, the instruction is to use the epinephrine. There are some scenarios where people will describe using epinephrine even without symptoms if you definitely ate a food that you had a serious reaction to before, or using the epinephrine with mild symptoms if you definitely ate the food uh, that was a big problem for you before you start having symptoms. But the typical, I may have said that too fast, but the typical instruction for giving epinephrine is that there's more than mild symptoms. It's more than an itchy mouth. It's more than a couple of hives or a few hives. It's more than a stomach ache. It's more than one vomit. Um, if you had vomiting plus hives, that would be epinephrine. If you have wheezing or coughing and repetitive coughing or anything like that, that's epinephrine. Um, if you're having um, hives and wheezing, obviously it, it, it's epinephrine. And if there's dizziness or impending doom feeling or lightheadedness or any of those things, that's all, those are all reasons for epinephrine. So uh, plenty of people who didn't use epinephrine have survived, but you don't want to like be waiting and having so things get worse. And if, no, and if you, it doesn't. And if you, um, one of the things that people I think get the wrong impression about, here's the question, answer as a group. When you, after you give epinephrine, you go to the, Right. So everybody is like, oh my God, epinephrine must be so dangerous because if you give it, you have to go to the emergency room. That's not a sentence that I use when I'm educating families. I say, if you're having a significant allergic reaction, you give epinephrine. And because you're having a significant allergic reaction, you certainly want to get to the emergency room so that you're going to feel a lot better after the epinephrine, but you still won't going to want to go there because you want them to monitor you for a few hours to make sure that the symptoms aren't coming back. Sometimes they'll come back worse than they were before, and you want to be in the right place if that happens. So although, yes, you should be going to the emergency room for a significant allergic reaction, it's not because you gave epinephrine. And again, as I mentioned before, having given the epinephrine, less likely you're going to need a second dose or stay overnight in the hospital. Um, raise your hand if you didn't get to ask a question and you have one. Yes? In terms of genetics, if you have multiple children and the oldest does have severe allergies and the rest of them do not, however, we're worried if you haven't tested for the same reason as before, that if they're eating everything, mm -hmm. all those things that the oldest child cannot eat. Um, however, since they might test positive for those things, then we might start not giving it to them. Not saying that we're not going to test them, because they haven't sh shown any signs so, of allergy. So I'm very confused. So if the younger children are already eating everything, they are already eating then everything. you would never test them. That so doesn't make any sense. Let's say a family does, most children do have and one child does not have. You would never test them that scenario. So, it, so um, based on what I told you before, that if I went to the park and forced people into tests, and every test of every, so once you're eating, so here's, here's another way of looking at it. Despite what you heard from two people who had the 3% thing happen, you know, most of the people who have food allergies aren't sitting in this room. So it, it, we do draw in people who've had more unusual situations, right? So you have to accept that the people sitting in this room today are special because they were, you know, they wanted to come and hear this because they've had a more significant thing happen. But the rules are still sort of the rules and it's, very common to be able to measure a positive blood test or measure a positive skin test in someone who's perfectly fine with the food. And, and when you've eaten the food in a food challenge, so a different scenario than what you're talking about, someone comes in, I, I, I don't know if I have this allergy or not because I ate this, I had a reaction, but now, you know, do I really still have it? If we feed them the food and they tolerate it 97% of the time, they're good for the rest of their life eating it. If I retest them in three years, their test is still positive, but why would I do that and say, oh, you better stop eating it now? They were eating it, they're fine. So it's the worst thing in the world to test someone who doesn't have a reason to be tested because you just make them think about it for no reason and you're not gonna change their diet. In terms of a child testing positive and, and he's still eating it. So let's say for example, honey nut Cheerios with almonds inside and the child is still eating almonds and now you test him, you stop giving him almonds 
is there a chance that you will develop a more severe allergy by not getting it? That's a different question. Um, as long as we're on the same page, because I'm going to answer it differently. And so I had mentioned. It was based on the first one. In other words, that was, a, that was the original concern. So I'm going to uh, go back to what I talked about very early when, when you asked me the question in the very beginning. I said that if I have someone who has a chronic allergic illness and the family thinks that a food is contributing to it, I'm going to be talking to them a lot about the risks of taking the food out of the diet, the social risks, the nutritional risks, and the risk of becoming more reactive to it. That is more typical to happen in someone who has allergic problems going on. So if your child that you're talking about, or let's generalize it, if there's a child who doesn't have eczema, doesn't have asthma, doesn't have hay fever, and they just have relatives who have that, I don't care about the relatives, that child's basically not a very allergic child. I don't, like when, when I'm eating, I don't think like, oh gee, you know, how long has it been since I ate a kiwi? Uh-oh, you know, I haven't had a kiwi for two years. Am I allergic to it? I'm never going to think that way if I don't have an allergic disposition. So a child with no allergic issues, sh we shouldn't have to worry about that. If we have a child who has allergic issues, um, taking a food away, especially if they already have a positive skin test but we're tolerating the food, could be a problem. So in studies that have looked at taking, for example, foods away from a child with atopic dermatitis, when they were eating the food, almost 20% of them became more anaphylactic to the food that they had in their diet to begin with. Now, some people who were eating that food may have had less eczema after it was taken away, and others it didn't make a difference, but they just took it away because of the test. But 20% had a bad outcome for taking a food away that maybe they didn't have to take away. So I'm not saying you shouldn't do it if it's the right reason to do it. This is getting back to, to what we were talking about in the way beginning. But the conversation has to be had because maybe the risk and benefit isn't worth it. Maybe you'd rather put 1% hydrocortisone ointment on the rash twice a week than take away a food that has a lot of impl implications to it. But, but what you're asking about is just a non-allergic person. I wouldn't be okay. worrying about yeah. it. So in other words, carry, yeah. Because, so for example, the rate of uh, peanut allergy, so we did a study looking at twins, and the rate of peanut allergy, sorry, I keep moving away from the camera. Um, the rate of peanut, if it's even working. It's probably, a, it's not even working. Um, the rate of peanut allergy in identical twins is guess. How many, so in identical twins, what's the rate of sharing peanut allergy? Take a guess. You would think because they're like the same, same womb, same genetics, blah, blah, blah. It's 66%. So it shows you it's in genetics and environment, but 66% is pretty high. What is it for fraternal twins? So those are just like siblings, except they were in the same womb and same age. 7%. So 7% is still higher than the general population, but it's you know, lower than the identical twins. Shows you again genetics environment. Having said that, the child who has eczema is showing you that they have an allergic disposition intrinsically to that child, and is at more risk of food allergy than if the child doesn't have eczema. So if you have those fraternal twins, and one has eczema and one doesn't, the one who doesn't is probably not going to have any food allergies, even though the one who did has a higher risk of doing that. So it's, if they both have eczema, then it's more than 7% chance that they both have it. Can I ask one last question? What's your advice regarding Time's up, okay. <laughs> What's your advice regarding siblings? Let's say my son is avoiding peanuts, tree nuts, whatever, mainly peanuts and tree nuts that I'm concerned about. Right. So like, I'm not bringing in the peanut butter, I'm not bringing in the nuts, so the other implicate, thing. Right, I thought that's where you were trying to ask about actually. So families have to make a, a decision about the way that you're controlling your home and it's gonna, be, it's gonna depend on you know, who's working when and what the ages of the kids are and stuff like that. So this is really just a personal decision scenario. You could talk about this with your allergist obviously too, but um, so you have you know, this older child who has these allergies and you, you make decisions like, do we want peanuts out of the house entirely? Do we want to let some of the family eat it? Is the child going to be grabbing the food? Am I going to make a mistake with putting, you know, the knife in the peanut butter jar and then jelly and then the ch other child's going to take like, it? More like when, let's say, the little one has it and the older kids want to eat out and eat peanuts, how often do we have to... Well, that is a totally different... That's, so, that's so, 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 in, 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 the in, 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 in the, in the first scenario, yeah. you have a household decision to make. If the, if, the, if, the old, if the younger, if the older child is, 
you know, mature and you're not worried about cross contact issues in the house, you could decide to feed it to your younger kids. I thought your question was going to be sort of like, oh, if I don't, will those younger kids become allergic? And the answer might be, if they're allergy prone, that might actually be an issue. But if not, maybe not. So that's something to talk about your allergist, with your allergist in your home. But then what you're saying is just like, hey, you know, the older kids are leaving the house to go to a restaurant and the younger kid's allergic. You know, as long as they're not bringing the food home and putting it in the no, child's mouth. They're avoiding it for like six months on end. Like I don't order like chicken with peanuts purposely. Like, right. Just, if they go out to eat and they, oh, mom, I ordered a ice cream, peanut butter ice cream. Okay, fine. But that's like once a year maybe. So how often do they need to eat nuts? Or does it matter? Well, if they're not, so it goes back to what you were asking about. If they're not an allergic kind of person, I would not thinking about it. Just like I wasn't thinking about, did I eat kiwi this year? There, there could be more of a risk if they have some allergic disposition and, them, you know. To give them the nuts. Yeah. Small. To eat it once in a while. Right. Um, you did not ask a question yet, did you? Okay. okay. Um, so he has a lot of allergies, peanuts and peanuts and goes into soy. Does taking a probiotic do anything for, let's say, if he eats soy, he's not having an anaphylactic reaction, but he's it's sensitive from the peanuts. Okay, so I'm going to separate your question again because you're, again, every, almost everyone's asking questions that are two <laughs> questions that are kind of intermingled in a way that they shouldn't be. So never mind the soy thing. The question of is what about probiotics? So probiotics, I wish I could tell you that probiotics made food allergies go away. It's kind of like, I didn't talk about the hygiene hypothesis, but you know, it's sort of like, why do we have allergies? We, we live too clean, so let's take some probiotics and make things better. Um, there, there really isn't study evidence at this point that you could get rid of food allergies by taking a probiotic. There's been you know, some signal in studies that if you know, mother and baby were taking probiotics, there might be a little bit less eczema, but even that is a little bit up in the air. There's no harm in taking a probiotic, and you know, I would say I wouldn't dissuade you from taking it, but I can't tell you that I would expect it to make the food allergy go away. One of the reasons for that is that when we look at um, the hygiene story, the, the microbiome, all those words that you hear, it's really communities of bacteria that are different in people who are in different uh, cultures or have different um, diets or have allergies or don't have allergies. It's not like there's one bacteria that's different. It's more like communities of bacteria that are different. And so it's not as simple as like just taking a lactobacillus kind of thing. And then your question about soy, I mean, there are people who are a little bit allergic to things and eat it anyway. I mean, that, that is the case. But I don't want to get people confused because it seems like that can happen pretty quickly to say, oh, gee, you know, go ahead and eat your food that you're allergic to anyway. No. But if, if you've spoken to your doctor about it, so for example, um, milk and egg allergy. So about 70% of kids with a milk allergy and about 70% of kids with an egg allergy tolerate baked foods that have egg in it or baked foods that have milk in it. So by that, I mean like muffins or a cookie. And the reason that's different is that there's both less of it, but even more important, it gets superheated. If you just put an egg or milk in the oven at 325, it crackles, it boils, it doesn't really get super hot or cooked. Whereas if it's in a muffin that gets to expand, it really does get you know, 300 degrees, and the protein gets broken down in a way that makes it tolerable to about 70%. That other 30% might have anaphylaxis from that product. So this isn't something that you try at home either. It's just to talk to your doctor about. But those are the kinds of variations that we see. And I mentioned it before. There are people who could eat you know, X number of peanuts but not more, or some people could have some beans and not others, or there are a lot of foods that only you typically cause mild allergic reactions. So these are all individual things. You shouldn't, like, not everyone's story applies to everyone. Okay. <laughs> I have this. Thank you. Yes, a good question from from the, live. from the from the phone. <laughs> okay, so this is from Ashley, and she wants to know: What do you do if the school is not on board with having an allergy kit? I guess not so allergy friendly and strict yeah. and enforcing. Yeah. <clears throat> so the question is about school, and I'm going to generalize it because usually the starting point is that. If we're talking about school, are we talking about like a daycare center? Are we talking about a school? Okay. And. Um, you know, the, you know, a federally funded school might have to follow different rules than a, a, a private school. Um, you're going to have, you know, different principals. You can have different school nurses or not a school nurse. You can have different teachers who have different experiences. Nowadays, most schools have kids that have food allergy in it. It's not very common to go into a school that doesn't have food allergy. 
One of the things that um, I would suggest people do, and again, I'm generalizing this, um, is to talk to your allergist about your child's food allergies and what your allergist thinks they might need done for them. And then when you go to the school, I wouldn't go to the school with a list of things that you need done for your child as your starting point of your conversation. That a lot of you probably go to the same schools, so maybe you know this doesn't apply well to this audience. But um, again, as general, I would say to the school, my child has food allergies. W what do you do for children with food allergies? Instead of saying, I have this list of 37 things I need you to do for food for my child. Then after they tell you what they do, you start asking questions like, have there been allergic reactions? How is that handled? Um, what happens in the cafeteria? Um, you mentioned blah, 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 but I was thinking such and such. You know, does anyone do it that way? Because I think it should be more of a conversation. Um, you might be worried about things that would make them feel like, wow, your child is so allergic that they can't come to this school. And that's just a miscommunication because of the way things are being presented. Um, the, this whole idea of airborne, you know, I, I've kind of tried to dispel some of the extreme parts of it. Um, you could have conversations about, you know, if, they're, if it's young kids, it's very different than if they're older kids. If they have a special table, what does that mean? Can you still sit with your friends? Um, and I'm not against, you know, any of that stuff. It's fine. If, they, if the way that the school is managing it is by having, you know, an allergy table, and I'm not calling an allergy-free table. It might be, or an allergy-safe table maybe, but an allergy-aware table. Like, it's not like a guarantee, but maybe they have more supervision. Um, and, but you, but if, if you're sitting your child alone, that's not good. I mean, something's wrong if that's what's happening. And, you know, they, they may have to control, uh, and again, I was going to say finger painting. Sometimes they smooth it out with eggs, so that you know, like you probably wouldn't want to have raw egg on your hands and touch your eyes and have a reaction if you're egg allergic. Um, try to trying to have uh, less food as rewards. Like, does every party really have to be food? Can't it be coloring or time to watch a movie or you know just something that's not a food related uh, scenario? Um, but you know, I, I like to tell the story that. Um, when my kids were in uh, like the preschool setting, they were in a co-op nursery, and uh, I actually took off of work to be the rotating parent there. And so uh, we have five kids; two of them were in this class at the same time because we have two sets of twins. And um, so, th so the kids were, you know, all over the place, like they're little kids. Um, they're playing; they're, they might be drooling or whatever. But when it was time to eat. Um, the, we, we, you know, clean the table, they wash their hands, and again, these are the little kids. I'm not, I mean, this isn't a high school thing, this isn't a sixth grade thing, this, these are the little kids. They sat down, they had their food, when it was done, the table was clean, they went back, they rinsed off their hands. They, they were not carrying their food around the room, they weren't playing with toys while they were eating, it was just like an isolated thing. My, th those two kids don't have food allergies, but of course I'm thinking food allergy, I'm watching all the kids, and I'm like, if, if there were kids with food allergy in this scenario, it would have been fine because everything was just like very isolated and regimented and organized. Um, so that would have worked even though they had no one in that room that was food allergic, but it would have worked if they did. So, you know, what, what is it about, you know, the, the classroom scenario? Is it like, well, I'm worried that, you know, they're, they, they're, they may have eaten on, on this, you know, count on this uh, desk and did they wash it and stuff like that? I mean, if that's really uh, a worry, Talk to your doctor about it, because a lot of times I'll be telling the patient I won't worry about that. Or, or people are like, well, what if the keyboard has like a crumb on it? It's like, well, let's talk about that, because is that really something to worry about? And, and for most people, it's not. Um, so, so there's a, or if, if you're really worried about it, then give your child wipes and let them wipe their hands off after. And if they're a child who's constantly sucking their thumb, that's different than if they're not. So it's very age, it very, differs a lot by age. So I think having open-ended conversations is the bottom line. Um, I think we're, oh, you didn't ask a question yet. Yes, okay. Hi, how are you? Um, I want to ask about something that's been going on like, in my family, coughing. I have like, my husband, he coughs for like six, for six months. Like September rolls around, May comes, and he stops the coughing. So I'm just thinking, like, what should we do? What can we do to, um, so just to put everyone at ease, isolated cough is not typical of a food allergy, but you would have to think about reflux and a whole bunch of other stuff. So I would have him talk to his doctor about it. It may not be an allergy. It doesn't have to be an allergy. He had like a mold allergy, and I think the doctor gave him some kind of medication. He said he's okay. 
Co yeah, coughing has a has a laundry list of, of reasons, right. and you know the types of doctors that might evaluate that are ear, nose, and throat doctors, right. allergists, and gastroenterologists, and pulmonologists, right. because you know it could be coming. So which one it, they go to? <clears throat> well, you would talk to your general That's doctor first. Princess. You would you would talk to your your uh, internist or pediatrician first as yeah. to which one would be the first stop. Because if it's someone who's like sneezing and dripping and rubbing their nose like this, then the allergist might be the first stop. If it's someone who has isolated coughing um, and it's happening like at bedtime, then the gastroenterologist might be the first person. And if it's just sort of random, then an ENT might be the first person. Right. And if there's wheezing, then a pulmonologist might be the first person. So there's more details. What, what does wheezing mean? Uh, like asthma. Oh. What's your take on nephrotic syndrome and allergy testing? What does that mean? So nephrotic syndrome is having protein in the urine, and usually there's swelling associated with that. I'm not aware of a food allergy but I was, I was in that. Told that um, it's linked to allergy testing. Linked to allergy testing, yeah. like allergy testing causes nephrotic yeah. syndrome. Never heard of that. Thank you for the idea to have the water. Um, okay, I think we're, oh, you didn't ask a question yet. So celiac is, is not what we've been talking about because it's not the kind of food allergy scenario that, that people came here today for. So it's a different kind of illness that's uh, gluten. So you know, basically wheat and barley and rye have, have the gluten protein in them. And celiac has different implications. There's not like an, you know, a typical immediate allergic reaction. It's more of a chronic illness and you can have a lot of different symptoms from it. It's not the typical allergy symptoms. And the testing for that are blood tests and endoscopy tests. You know, so, so it's a lot different. And gastroenterologists usually manage it. Wait, to that question, how, how um, early can you test the celiac check in a baby? Would mm -hmm. it be accurate? Mm -hmm. if, the baby's if the baby's on wheat. Okay. Yes. It's a bit of therapy, right, to get somebody used to it. Um, I'm assuming you can do it in the middle of this, right? Uh, that so would not practice, be a, what's that? Practice, your practice. Yeah, so my, my practice isn't doing the low-dose oral immunotherapy that I've been talking about. We've been studying it. Um, and we have it on studies. And as I mentioned before, you can find people in private practices that might do it, and it's controversial. You know, there's, there's you know, there, in our national meetings, there are people who stand up on the stage and argue whether it's a good idea or not. And, you know, there's, there's success stories and there's failure stories, and it's, it's sort of an evolution. Are you guys thinking of doing it? We're always thinking about it. <laughs> um, I think we're on seconds. I'm not seeing okay. hands up for, oh, oh, did you ask, you didn't ask a question yet, did you? Uh, I just want to ask a, <laughs> a straightforward question. Yes. Um, in your experience, what is the frequency of children who have had the higher peak testing for, let's say, the milk at, uh, allergy or the egg allergy that have actually outgrown it? Do they have a chance? Or <clears throat> yes, so, um, so just to make sure I'm on the same. Right, and when would you recommend starting that if the answer is yes? Just to make sure we're on the same page, we're talking about the milk or egg allergic child, where 70%, that's, that's the experience, are able to tolerate baked milk or baked egg, um, so in baked goods, uh, the, the kids who are able to do that and add it to their diet seem to be better off in terms of prognosis for outgrowing it. Right. And so what we do is we'll usually um, get them onto that food during a food challenge if they haven't already had it encourage them to have it fairly routinely, and then recheck them every six months, and at some point do a food challenge to more, like, less cooked kind of uh, food. So that would mean cheese or regular milk, or it would mean, like, French toast or scrambled eggs. I think we're on seconds. It's time for seconds. So, uh, two more questions. <laughs> okay. Um, go ahead. Okay. I actually did allergy testing on my daughter two days, found out that she has a severe peanut allergy. My doctor told Stop me there. Um, so you did peanut allergy testing on your daughter today yes. and found out from the test that she has a severe peanut allergy. Well, so just so everyone remembers, I'm, I'm going to let you ask your question. You I'm going to let you okay. tell the story and modify it. But <laughs> when someone does a test and says, you have a severe allergy, is that are they interpreting the test correctly? Yeah. No. It, it depends on the history. So if you said, my child ate peanut and ended up getting three rounds of epinephrine in the emergency room, then I would say, yes, your child seems to have a severe peanut allergy. But you can't show me a skin test or a blood test and say my child has a severe allergy. Just wanted to just make sure everyone remembered that. But go ahead and ask your question. Wait, so then now I have a different question. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Because now, because when, when, when the doctor looked at the skin test, he had said, 
your child has a severe peanut allergy. So what he could have said was, this is a large skin test, so I'm pretty sure your child has a peanut allergy. Okay. Does your child have asthma? He said, he said um, that the next time I should come in would be in a year from now where we'll look at other nuts. He does not want to take a look at any other nuts. How old's your child? She's 11, uh, 10 months. Um, it's a personal decision. I, I would have... So in a person who came to me <laughs> with that okay. scenario, um, I would talk to the person about what they think they want to feed their child in the coming year. So for someone who has a, who, for someone who has a peanut allergy, um, they're, statistically speaking, they're, so peanuts different than walnut, almond, Brazil, cashew, hazel, pecan, pistachio, pine, macadamia, it's different food. Those are different foods. So if you're allergic to peanut, the only reason we worry about tree nuts is the statistic that you're an allergic kind of person. I might as well be talking about egg. It's also up there. It's higher, actually. So, so if we get back to the question at hand, it would be, am I planning to feed my child nuts in the next six months before I see you again, doctor? And if the answer is, yeah, we would like to you know, have almond, or our family eats a lot of walnuts all the time, and I'd like to know, then yeah, I would do the testing. Because, they're, because if I don't do the testing and tell you to eat it, I'm basically saying you have a 35% chance of a problem, but who cares? Go ahead home and try it on your own. So I don't think it would be fair not to test in that scenario, bless you, you might need an allergist. But <laughs> the, the, with that 35% risk, if I skin test it was negative and you were going to add it in the, in the coming months, then it would be worth testing. If you weren't, then I would say, ah, let's wait because who cares, you're not going to add it anyway. So again, we're, we're back to, well, gee, my other child loves Nutella, so let's test hazel. My other child eats, you know, uh, Barney butter, let's test almond, yeah. So it would be individualized. So what my question was going to be was that if, so since you said, like, should I expose her, should I expose her, should I make the plan to expose her to other nuts in order to prevent <coughs> a, a further allergy to other types That's of That's a great question. It's a theoretical question to some okay. point because... For someone who uh, is high risk for allergy, for right. peanut as a prevention, so not your child, not your child, okay. her, someone else, um, comes in with severe eczema and egg allergy and isn't yet peanut allergic, the instruction is to eat peanut in large quantities, like two teaspoons worth of infant safe peanut three times a week for five years. So if you start saying, oh, I want to do that for the 11 nuts, I won't rattle them off again, they'd be eating nuts all day. And that's not going to happen, and it's sort of impractical. So, so if you wanted to try to do that, you could, but most people don't. So I have the conversation I described before, like what is practical for you to do given what your family does to make your household not be unusual to what it is yesterday, what it was yesterday, and then we have a conversation about what makes sense to test. It wouldn't make sense to test for Brazil nut because there's almost no chance you can eat that, right? So you. Can I end up one attachment to that? <laughs> so basically, my, my son, my older son, so she's 11 months old, he's two and a half, loves peanut butter and jelly. Oh, he has it all the time. He does have severe eczema. Now, I just decided today I'm going to be a peanut free home. Is that a bad idea for him? So uh, that is a really good theoretical question that uh, I think more allergists than not would say that since you've been successfully so far, feeding uh, the older child yeah. peanut butter without the younger child getting it. And if we're back to the organized home scenario, your home is that organized that it's not a risk where the jelly's gonna have peanut butter in it or the child's gonna grab from the child. I would say leave well enough alone and keep doing what you're doing. Generalizing this to someone who might ask me a question like that, but I don't know your family in detail, so maybe it's different. Um, the, the theory would be that that might be somebody who is better off at least occasionally having it in their diet, as opposed to them going off of it for a long period of time. It's back to that 20% thing I talked about before, and you know, people who go off of a food just because their test was positive and they didn't have to, and all of that. Um, so, last question. Why don't you pick who the last person is? I feel guilty now. I gave everyone one question. See, it's not easy. Is there any foods that you should avoid giving, such as like eggs, soy, milk, or do you think that you should give it to them and see how they react? So uh, it kind of depends on how bad the eczema is. Mm -hmm. If it was very severe eczema and they haven't eaten those foods yet, which you know I don't know details here at all, yeah. um, you might want to talk to your pediatrician first. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's not severe eczema, there isn't like a 
there isn't uh, you know, a written guideline anywhere that says, oh, you just have eczema, so you shouldn't eat foods. It's, you would just eat, eat as you would eat. You just eat anything you'd want. Um, if then the family thinks, oh, the eczema is getting worse, I'm going to stop giving the food, I would say you definitely want to talk to the doctor because, again, eczema goes up and down, and once you start saying, is it a food, then it's like, oh, I bet it was the food, and then you're off the food, and then you're in trouble in, you know, in a year from now. Okay, so thank you. Thank you.